Montgomery Jones and the Wizard's Revenge by L. H. Damelin, read by Peter Gilchrist, Chapter One. Us. So good to be back, thought Douglas with a smile, staring up at Uncle Montgomery's house. The old place had not changed a bit in the time he'd been away. The ivy-covered mansion portion of the house was just as stately. Yes, and dilapidated as he remembered. And the castle hall with its ancient stone walls and turrets and cannons was as imposing and, and otherworldly as ever. There was the tower, that strange and wonderful Cyclops Tower with its single large round window and dome roof and clock room and mischievous weathercock. <laughs> oh yes, it was good to be back. Douglas began to climb the weed-choked stone path that spiraled its way up the hill towards the old wooden door at the foot of the tower. It was a hot summer day, and all around him the air pulsated with the sounds of bird and insect life. I don't remember the hill being so steep, he remarked to himself, as he struggled up the narrow path, growing increasingly irritated by the great many flies and winged insects that kept so buzzing around his head and landing on his face. After what seemed like an eternity of clambering up the path, which had become steeper and more treacherous with every turn, Douglas found he had to stop, just to stop and take a break, for he was quite exhausted. The heat of the day had become so oppressive, and when he looked up at the house, he discovered, to his amazement, that after all his efforts, he hadn't got any closer to it. If anything, the old house seemed to be further away from him now than when he first began his ascent towards it. Suddenly, the hill began to shake as if hit by an earthquake, knocking Douglas off his feet and causing the house to tremble and wobble like a strange misshapen jelly. Large slabs of stone dislodged from the castle hall and rolled noisily and perilously down the hill. It's a plaster and shattered window panes crashed on the hillside as large cracks began to appear in the walls of the mansion. Then the bronze tower dome lifted off the top of the tower, like, like, like the lid of a giant mustard pot, and from the top of the now roofless tower, huge silvery soap bubbles began to emerge, each one larger than the next. Soon, the whole sky was filled with them, and when the bubbles popped with deafening explosions, they sent a strange a drizzle down onto the bedraggled hillside, which covered everything in a silvery, soapy foam. To make matters worse, those irritating flying insects were still buzzing around Douglas' head, and it suddenly became apparent they weren't insects. At all, but tiny winged Montgomery Joneses, all shouting in unison, Wake up, Douglas! Wake up, Douglas! Douglas, wake up! Douglas sat bolt upright in bed. As his eyes adjusted to the darkness, he found to his great relief he was in the familiar surroundings of his room faintly lit by the orange glow of a distant street lamp. Noticing the luminescent dial of his watch on the bedside table, he saw it was just a little after three in the morning. Boy, that was some, some weird dream, he exclaimed. Oh, God, you're finally awake, said a familiar voice. I've been trying to get you up for some time, but you're a very sound sleeper, and it's been quite a battle. At any rate, I can't tell you how good it is to see you, my boy. Uncle Monty, 
What crazy dream is this? exclaimed poor Douglas in a panic. No, no, I assure you, you're, you're quite awake now, laughed Montgomery Jones. I'm in your room and as real as you are, and to be honest, I'm not quite the Montgomery Jones you know and love. Why? Are you invisible? Oh, I'm quite invisible. It's just I'm sitting in your ear. In my what? exclaimed Douglas incredulously. It was the only way I could get to be loud enough to wake you up in, um, well, in, in my condition, replied Montgomery Jones. You see, as it happens, I've been turned into, um, uh, uh, I will switch on your light and see for yourself. Douglas got out of bed, sat at his desk and quite convinced he was still fast asleep and dreaming despite his uncle's assurances, switched on his overhead desk lamp. At first, with his eyes not quite accustomed to the brightness, all Douglas could make out were the familiar pencil marks and ink stains and the dotted surface of the desk. But suddenly, he noticed what appeared to be a small insect-like creature, with a pair of slender translucent wings perched on the edge of his of his plastic ruler. Hello, Ducky, said the insect in a voice that was surprisingly loud for something not much bigger than a, a raisin. Is this simply incredible or what, eh? Any moment from now, you know, I'll wake up and it'll be morning and I'll get dressed and I'll go downstairs and tell everyone at the breakfast table that during the craziest dream I've ever had, I'm ever likely to have, <laughs> Uncle Monty appeared to be in the form of a, a tiny sort of winged bug. Winged bug, indeed, exclaimed Monty Jones indignantly. I've only been shrunk a tad and gained some additional body parts. I certainly wouldn't classify that as a winged bug by any stretch of the imagination. Fascinating. Totally weird, but fascinating nonetheless, remarked Douglas, staring at his minuscule uncle with a magnifying glass. It is you, after all, Uncle Monty. It's just a tiny you, with two wings protruding from the back of your suit jacket, and, and what appears to be a pair of feelers sticking out from your forehead. Yes, it's quite incredible, I have to say. It's, it's also rather fortunate that my metamorphosis didn't progress any further, for if it had, you would be staring at a, a fully formed mayfly, and I would be in serious trouble. How on earth did you manage this, Uncle Marvel Douglas? Did one of your inventions go horribly wrong again? <laughs> oh, no. This type of thing is way beyond my capabilities, <laughs> chuckled the tiny man. No, I'm the victim of none other than Wizard Haran himself. A wizard? But we destroyed his mirrors, and with them, the only passage that would allow him to travel from the world of fantasy to our world, cried Douglas. How was he, how was he able to get to you? Well, incredibly. He has created an entirely new passage to our world, and it's a direct consequence of us having travelled to the world of fantasy, I'm sorry to say, replied his uncle. I'm you know, completely confused, exclaimed Douglas. I simply don't understand how a wizard from the world of fantasy can travel to our world in the first place. I certainly don't understand how he can hang around in our world given the existence of the absolutely out-of-the-question rule, which makes it quite clear that magic cannot exist in this world. I mean, he should have returned instantly to the world of fantasy. The moment his presence was detected in our world, it just, it just makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> As per usual, my boy, you have hit on the most important point, replied Uncle Monty. Old Wizard Heron will only be sucked back into the world of fantasy 
if he is detected by the absolutely out of the question rule. But the sorcerer has come up with a brilliant plan to slip into our world undetected, and as long as he stays that way, he'll be able to remain here indefinitely. But what brilliant plan? Well, in order to explain that, it's easier to begin with an explanation of how I come to you looking like this, said Uncle Monty, flapping his wings. It all began the day before yesterday. I was at my desk in the library hall, attempting to decipher a very old and a uh, very poorly written manuscript by Bartholomew von Grumpelberger. Perhaps, you know, the greatest ghost hunter of all time. Well, that's a story for another day. Anyway, I was just about to open the desk drawer and retrieve a delicious cheese and tomato sandwich for my lunch break when suddenly the hall was filled with an incredibly loud popping sound. I suppose like a cork popping out of a champagne bottle, but much, much louder. I was so startled by this sudden explosion of noise that I knocked my chair off balance, causing it to topple backwards and me along with it. My fall must have resulted in a rather hard whack on the head, because I don't remember what followed after that. Suffice to say, I woke up some time later to find myself still sitting in the toppled over chair with a rather large bump on the back of my head and a splitting headache. Well, look who's finally decided to rise and shine, sneered an oddly familiar voice. I was beginning to worry, Jones, that you weren't going to wake up after your little tumble. And that would have been so disappointing, because I have such fun planned for us. Somewhat dizzy and with prickles of fear beginning to travel up my spine, I rolled off the fallen chair, got to my feet, turned round and found myself staring at one of the strangest sights I've seen in a long while. About two metres from me and suspended in mid-air was a giant perfectly formed, gleaming soap bubble. And sitting cross-legged at the centre of this transparent sphere, in a purple suit and pink spotted bow tie, no less, was none other than wicked wizard Heron himself. He has a, a new body, then, exclaimed Douglas. Indeed, he does. And there was none of that long white hair, nasty teeth, and a flame sprouting forehead that we witnessed just before having to flee for our lives on the flying table during our last encounter with his lordship, remarked Uncle Montgomery. The wizard has completely reinvigorated himself. He would, he would pass for a man in his forties. One would never suspect for a moment that he is thousands of years old. Incredible. Well, what, what happened next? Well, it was then that I noticed that beside the wizard in his bubble was a long silver hooker adorned with strange mystical engravings to which was attached a slender and slightly luminous tube. A, 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 a silver what? asked Douglas. A hooker, my boy. A Persian tobacco pipe. You've no doubt seen one before. Tobacco is placed at the top of the pipe and lit. The smoke from the burning tobacco is then inhaled using a long tube. By puffing on the end of the tube, the smoker draws the smoke from the top of the hooker and through a water-containing vessel at its bottom, and then the smoke travels up the tube and into the smoker's mouth. Yes, I think I have seen one of those before, in, in a movie. Well... Observing the wizard, I watched with some amazement that as he smoked his hooker, no smoke was produced. Instead, with every puff, hundreds of small round bubbles emerged from his mouth. The bubbles rose upwards until they bumped into the inner wall of the bubble the wizard was sitting in. And instead of popping, 
they appear to melt into the large bubble's transparent surface, producing tiny bursts of bright blue light with each collision. Wizard Ron, what a pleasant surprise, I exclaimed, trying to appear as nonchalant as possible, but obviously realising the quicker I got out of the hall, the better. What, what brings you to this neck of the woods? Why, you, of course, Jones. I have come for you, replied the sorcerer with a devilish grin. Ah, 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 nice, I lied, slowly retreating towards the library exit. To what do I um, owe the honor of such a visit? <laughs> Don't play the fool with me, you nasty little man, snapped the wizard. I told you I would have my revenge. And here I am, to collect it. Oh, although revenge is a dish best served cold, I'm sure it also goes darn well with a nice cup of tea. I'm just off to put the kettle on. I, 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 I won't be wrong. I remarked to make a desperate dash for the exit. You were not, roared the wizard. And that's when things took a turn for the worse. Let me guess. Your curiosity got the better of you, so you stuck around to see what would happen and soon found yourself in deep trouble, said Douglas with a grin. Ah, you know your old uncle too well, said Montgomery Jones with a laugh. That's precisely what happened. I had made it to the library door, and I'd have probably escaped the wizard's clutches in the nick of time, were it not for one of those strange popping the sound and made me turn round to see what was going on. It was then I observed with amazement that with one puff on his pipe, the wizard had enlarged the bubble he was sitting in to double its size. An instant later, this larger bubble had divided into two bubbles of equal size, one still occupied by the wizard and the other empty floating towards me at incredible speed. Well, I now I stood absolutely no chance of getting away. The bubble reached me in a matter of seconds, engulfed me as a shark swallows an anchovy with just one gulp, and then suspended itself in midair with, with me, trapped inside. <laughs> what do you think of my pretty little bubbles, Churns? Smirked the spellbound with a smile. Do you know that they are lighter than air, more stretchable than any rubber, and yet stronger than the strongest steel? Why, the sharpest needle in existence won't burst the bubble you're sitting in. Its surface will simply stretch around the point of the needle. What's more, my bubbles are ever so obliging. With just the wave of a hand, they go up. Down, left, right, any way I fancy, said the wizard, making my strange cage bounce around the room in all manner of directions, like a ball being knocked about in a pinball machine. I can even make them rotate. It makes one dizzy thinking of all the possibilities. With that, the bubble began to revolve like the drum of a washing machine, and I found myself being turned head over heel so many times that soon overwhelming dizziness brought me close to fainting. Best of all, continued the wizard, bringing the bubble to a sudden stop. They allow me to be here in your world, completely undetected by the absolutely out of the question rule and free to practice my magic. Just as if I was in the world of fantasy. Clever, oh, don't you agree? Clever, <laughs> indeed, I replied, trying to keep my wits about me, even though I could barely see out of my eyes. My poor head felt like it was about to fall off and the room still stubbornly refused to stop spinning. How, how do they work? It's far too complicated for your puny brain to comprehend, <laughs> smirked the Wizard of Gamroth. But in stupid man's terms, the bubbles are double-layered. The first layer, the one 
that faces outwards towards your world is made of reality, while the second layer, the one that faces inwards, is made of fantasy. Good gosh, I read. No wonder you haven't been detected by the absolutely out-of-the-question rule. As far as it's concerned, these bubbles are real because they, they have an outer layer of reality, just like the outer mincemeat layer of a scotch egg. And because the inside of the bubble, you know, the egg part, has a layer of fantasy in it, you can exist within that and, I dare say, even perform your magic in it without being detected. Why, as if you'd made a small world of fantasy for yourself, right here in the world of reality. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Small now, but getting bigger by the second, retorted the wizard. With every puff of my pipe, this bubble is expanding, and soon it'll be big enough to engulf your house. And then your town, then the surrounding towns and cities eventually. I'll have created a bubble big enough to envelop the entire world of reality. Yes, that's right, Jones. Thanks to you and your meddling nephew, I will have complete dominion over the world of reality and all the piddly people in it. But why? Why, 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 why are we responsible for this fiasco, cried Douglas. Well, it turns out that after we fled Arun's castle on the flying table and the wizard's exploding wrath blew the whole place to smithereens, two things happened, replied his uncle. First was that the blast was so powerful that it destroyed Vipora's spell and released the wizard from his island. And the second was that the wizard's rage vaporized the mirror passage, sending clouds of the mirror vapor all over the place. And because the mirror passage existed in both worlds of fantasy and reality, it contained elements of both worlds. So it is this very vapor that the wizard has used to make his devilishly devious bi-layered bubbles. So, not only did we free the old villain by causing him to explode, but by also creating the mirror passage with a marvellous spinning mirror meddler. We gave him the means to travel to our world and potentially take it over. All of this was in my dream, explained Douglas. I saw the house and the bubbles, although they were popping all over the place, and you as a bug. I dreamt of all this before you woke me up. Oh, how very peculiar, remarked Monty. And you say you saw the bubbles popping, he explained, flying around and around the desk lamp. It may be some kind of premonition. There may be some hope yet of getting rid of the old crook. Stop that, Uncle Monty. You're going to burn yourself on that bulb. I, I, I can't help it. it. It's the mayfly in me. I, I'm finding the light irresistible, oh dear, I think I've just singed my suit. Really? Uncle Monty, you're quite impossible sometimes, said Douglas, turning off the light. And after all this, you still haven't told me why you're literally such a, a, a bug. That's right, I haven't. Now that you mention it, said his uncle with a laugh. Well, after the wizard's little triumphant speech... He turned to me and smiled, a smile of such evil delight. It gave me, it gave me quite a turn. Yes, he said, grinning from ear to ear. I will so enjoy ruling this world. But that is just a bonus, you see. When everything turned to rage and exploded, when everything was destroyed, I was almost spent, almost finished. It took a long time to regain my strength and my wits. For a while, there was touch and go, and I must admit, I still haven't regained my full powers. But one thing saw me through, Jones, one singular purpose, and that was to come here and make you pay for all the damage you have wrought. I promised I would have my revenge, and here I am. I've kept my promise and it's time for you to pay up. 
Well, I guess I, I should be flattered. I said, desperately trying to think of a way out of the extremely nasty pickle I was in. Be flattered if you must. I'd prefer you to be sort of less flattered and more dead, retorted the spellbinder. And on that subject, I suppose you are wondering how I plan to administer my revenge. I must admit, I was rather at a loss with what to do with you, because the usual punishments that I've doled out and those who disappointed me in the past, such as being torn apart by hyenas, or dismembered on the rack, or pecked to death by ravenous crows, are, are drowned in the tar and boiled alive in hot sugar syrup. Seems rather droll for a man of your, uh, your talents. And of course, all these procedures tend to cause the victim to focus on the punishments rather than the crime. And you need plenty of time to dwell on both. So I've decided to turn you into a bug, a mayfly, a small useless winged insect that is fit for nothing but fish food. As you are no doubt aware, the lifespan of a male mayfly is no more than two days, which gives you plenty of time to consider your crimes and your mortality. Oh yes, I shall take great pleasure in watching you flap around hopelessly and helplessly while your little insect life ebbs away. And when you've given up the ghost, I shall stick a pin in your winged remains and keep it as a memento in my rather extensive butterfly collection. A fitting end for a despicable individual. Oh, thank man for crying out loud, stay calm and think of a, you know, a logical way out of this. You've only a few moments to spare. I berated myself silently. Now, Ron said that his bubbles are too strong to puncture, but they seem to be made of some kind of soap, because the walls of his bubbles feel soapy, I told myself, feeling the inside of my transparent prison cell. And what pops soap bubbles better than anything else? Why, fat, Monte Opal, fat and oil and grease. But how am I going to get my hands on any of these? Suddenly, I had a flash of inspiration. I knew exactly what to do. I just had to create the opportunity in which to do it. That got your tongue, Jones. Contemplating your imminent doom. Well, if you're considering getting on your knees and begging for my forgiveness or pleading for mercy, it would be pointless. Your fate is sealed, sneered the wizard. As nasty as it all sounds, I'm not the begging or pleading sort, I replied. But I would appreciate a last request. Uh, since I'm feeling especially magnanimous today, I could consider a last request. What is it you want, said the wizard. Let me, let me write a letter, a brief farewell note to Douglas, telling him what has happened. I think it's only decent that my family know of my fate. I paper in my desk. It'll just take a moment. Granted. But no playing the fool, Jones. Mess with me and you'll wish you're an insect by the time I'm done with you. With that, the bubble I was in floated silently towards my desk and engulfed it. It must have been a most peculiar sight. Me sitting at my desk, suspended in a mid-air inside a large soap bubble. Hurry up, Jones, I don't have all day, snapped the wizard. Hold your horses around. I'm just getting a sheet of paper from my desk, for I won't be long, I said, taking hold of my pencil and opening the top drawer. Then, as quick as a flash, I rammed the pencil into the generously buttered cheese and tomato sandwich that had been there all along. Hold, 
a butter coat and pencil out of my uneaten lunch and ram its graphite tip into the wall of the bubble with all my strength. You calculating devious little shrieked wizard, but he never got to finish his sentence for which a deafening bang and stunning electric blue flash, the bubble I was in burst, and so did the wizard shortly after, and in an instant he was gone. How long is he gone for is anyone's guess, but he'll be back, of course. For when the bubble burst and he was returned to the world of fantasy, his hooker went with him. So it's only a matter of time before he's able to generate a another bubble to travel back to our world in. And when he returns, he'll probably be a million times more wrathful and vengeful than before, and a lot harder to get rid of. Naturally, I, I wasn't going to stick around to find out, so I, I flew out of the hall as fast as my little inset wings could carry me, hitched a ride on a train, bus, and here I am. That is all so incredible, remarked Douglas. But there's a bunch of things I, I, I you know, I, I just don't understand. Firstly, if you're able to pop the bubble and send the wizard back to the world of fantasy, how was he able to turn you into your current form? And if you only popped your bubble, why did the wizard's bubble pop as well? And what I really don't understand is why you're even allowed to exist in our world. I mean, you're part insect, for crying out loud. It makes no sense that you weren't sucked into the world of fantasy along with the wizard. Well, uh, these questions have certainly crossed my mind as well, remarked his winged uncle. And this is what I think. When the Wizard of Gamroth saw what I was up to, he cast his spell as quickly as he could in an attempt to foil my plan, but luckily for me, I was a fraction faster than him. So although the spell was cast, it could not run its full course. So I was only partially transformed. I am most fortunate in this regard. If the spell had been allowed to transform me completely, it would have been impossible to get you before my life was a, as a mayfly had come to an end. In short, I would have been done for. Now, as to the popping bubble puzzle, I can only assume that both bubbles popped because they were connected somehow, perhaps by an invisible tube of some sort. For how else could the wizard perform magic in his bubble and mine at the same time? It's not like the magic could cross between the bubbles, because the absolutely out of the question rule would have detected that. No, the bubbles had to be connected so that the magic could pass between them, and that explains why bursting one caused the other to pop. When you break a connection, you create an opening, and with the opening, a leak of magic in this case. And of course, with the leak, the magic was instantly detected by the absolutely out of the question rule, and it was back in the world of fantasy for the wizard before he could say, jumping Jack Robinson. And as for me, being able to exist in this world as part Mayfly, I must admit I'm rather flummoxed. Have you got any suggestions? Well, do you remember when I was sent by the wizard to retrieve Viporous spell parchment, said Douglas? Yes, what of it? Well, if you recall, I was sent back to this world through the mirror passage with Viporous skull and instructed to use the skull to find the parchment in the castle hall. And when I did and passed the parchment through the mirror passage to Haran, he broke his promise and refused to let me return to the world of fancy or to release you from your watery predicament. And it was only by being able to get in touch with Muggins the Leprechaun via his amulet and breaking the skull that I was able to get to the world of fantasy and rescue you. Oh, yes, yes, of course I recall it, but what's that got to do with the price of eggs? remarked Monty impatiently. Don't you remember? 
I had to break the skull to get back to the world of fantasy, because although it had far too much magic in it to exist in our world, the magic was trapped inside and undetectable until the skull was broken. Then the magic was released. The absolutely out of the question rule detected it, and I was returned to the world of fantasy. Well, what if a similar thing applies to you? What if all that magic associated with your current state is invisible to the absolutely out of the question rule because it's all trapped inside somehow? Galloping gobstopper, sure you're absolutely spot on, cried Montgomery Jones, whizzing around Douglas' head excitedly. I've been thinking of the wizard's bubbles as nothing more than well, sim simple soap bubbles. And you pop a soap bubble, it bursts into soapy liquid. But my thinking is completely wrong. The wizard's bubbles are super strong and super stretchy, so they're more like balloons than bubbles. And what happens when you slowly let the air out of the balloon? It shrinks, of course. It doesn't burst, it shrinks. Don't you see, my boy, when I punctured the bubble, it, it shrank, completely encased me like a sausage skin. Because of its super stretchiness, it completely molded to my shape. Why, I've been flying around in a skin-tight bubble suit all this time and hadn't even noticed. And because I'm completely encased in it, I'm completely undetectable completely invisible to the absolutely out of the question rule. It makes perfect sense. Can you see it with your magnifying glass? No, I, I can't, said Douglas. You, you have, a, have a bit of a sheen to you, but that's all, I'm afraid. Drat. It's all well and good to make assumptions, but without actually confirming the presence of the bubble, my theory is... Well, it could be pie in the sky, and we have to confirm it's there because then we can work out how to damage it in a way that allows the absolutely out of the question rule to see me. But that would result in us being sucked into the world of fantasy, exclaimed Douglas. Well, of course, but where else can I get this ridiculous spell reversed? I can't spend the rest of my life as part mayfly. Uh, it's, it's, it's most inconvenient. We must also find someone in that world who can help us get Wizard Haron back to the world of fantasy permanently. I mean, he's quite deranged. You must stop him before it's too late. Now, I think a much closer examination of my person is wanted. Do you have a microscope? Uh, no, sorry, said Douglas. Oh, drat again. Now, hold on. There are microscopes in the science lab at school, but it's half past three on a Sunday morning, Dougie. How do you plan to get in? Well, I know someone who can help. This is just up her alley, said Douglas with a smile. Oh? Are you sure you want to involve a third party in our adventure, said his uncle? In my experience, most people regard this sort of thing as a bunch of old cod's wallop. Why, I, 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 I've been called a lunatic more times uh, than I've had hot meals. Oh, I, I wouldn't worry about that, Uncle Monty. She's the sort of person who finds all this stuff fascinating. Oh, uh, OK, then. I'll take your word for it. Now get dressed, grab a snack, and let's be off. I'll meet you at the front gate in ten minutes. Now, for heaven's sake, try not to wake anybody up in the process, said Monty, flying out of the window. <laughs> Can you imagine trying to explain all this to your parents?